Hey friends, this is Michael Bohm with Youth Apologetics Training. Today we're going to keep going with this series with Ian Juby of Genesis Week. We're talking about the evidence for a global flood. If you haven't heard the first two parts of this series, you got to check them out. Uh, Ian's doing a bang-up job, and today we're just going to pick right up where we left off yesterday. So with that, let's go ahead and jump right in. Yeah, I heard, uh, I've also heard the Cretaceous layer is pretty much all chalk, and it and it wraps around the whole planet, which is another, oh gosh, I, I remember hearing a different creation video series where they talked about that and how it was evidence of the entire planet being underwater. Yes, and that again comes from Dr. Derek Ager. That was another book called The Nature of the Stratigraphic Record, in which he documented that. So remember, this is an evolutionist talking about this now. And he uh, had literally traveled the world following this layer, uh, uh, Cretaceous layer, you're right, to the time of the dinosaurs is what, <coughs> excuse me, is what they would call it. Um, it contains dinosaur fossils, dinosaur tracks, um, also contains copious fossil clams buried alive. Um, that's the outcrops you will see in the Glen Rose area of Texas or down in the San Antonio area of Texas, for example. Uh, it's the same layer. And that layer is found in uh, all over North America. It's found in Australia as the Jinjin chalk. It's found in Europe and Russia. Uh, Portions of it are found in Antarctica. And so the the basic premise, if you can envision this for a second, according to the evolutionary model, all these layers were laid down at the same time. They're all Cretaceous. So what they're suggesting is that, well, no, it wasn't a worldwide flood. It was the land sunk. And that was Charles Lyell's idea. He was trying to stay away from a worldwide flood, right? (laughs) So (laughs) he's got to come up with another explanation for how all these water-deposited sediments got formed. Well, it's because the land sunk, not because the waters rose. Okay, well, let's take it at face value then. All All these continents all sunk at the same time because they all have the same Cretaceous layer composed of the same rocks and it's actually the same rock sequence because Dr. Ager was looking at the rock layers above and below the Cretaceous chocks which also match the layers above and below on all the other continents. So what you get is you get all the continents sinking at once. Well, what do you get? A worldwide flood. And the thing is, those layers form also the mountains. And so those layers were all laid down horizontally and then through continental division were all crumpled up into the mountains. So basically continents pretty much collided with each other, if you can picture that. And so like a car runs into a brick wall, you know, the hood crumples up, right? Well, it's the same idea with mountains. All these sedimentary rock layers were originally horizontal, colliding with each other, crumple up into mountains. And so... Once again, it all boils down to the same principle. You have a worldwide flood before the mountains were formed. So, as you see in Psalms, the mountains rose up out of the floodwaters. It all lines up exactly with the worldwide flood and exactly with the biblical account of history of the world. Amen. Yeah, the mountains rose up, the valleys sunk down, Mm -hmm. the waters rushed to the lower parts, Mm -hmm. and uh, there's our modern geology right there. Mm -hmm. God, God rearranged the real estate. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what about planation? Am I pronouncing that right? Planation, yeah, that's right. Um, where you have these vast areas that are pretty much leveled flat, nice and smooth. Uh, oftentimes, you'll find rounded rocks uh, all over these flattened areas, and, and rounded rocks generally are formed, as far as I understand, by uh, moving through rushing water and they're clanking against each other as they're spinning Mm -hmm. and it it rounds them off. How in the world did that happen in a uniformitarian geologist evolution worldview? Right. Uh, I have yet to hear evolutionists explain that one actually. Um, But let's explain what it is first we're talking about. Uh, Basically, um, now I just I just finished, I just had a paper published on this in Creation Research Society Quarterly a couple of months ago. Um, this was a, a three-year study project I did on the mountains of the east coast of Canada. And uh, here I'd been walking on it the whole time and didn't even realize it 
until I saw an aerial picture of the Cape Breton Highlands in the Museum of Natural History in Halifax. And I took one look at it and said, wow, hold on a minute, I've driven across that. The whole mountain is what we call a planation surface. Basically, if you can picture a mountain, now take that mountain and take a, hopefully people will know what a wood planer is. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's this wood carving machine that carves the surface of the wood flat. And it's the entire top of these mountains, as far as the eye can see, have all been cut off completely flat. What on earth would do that? Now, glaciers don't do that. Glaciers, first of all, flow down, flow downhill. That's the definition of a glacier. They go downhill. Glaciers I mean, carve much. gouges. They don't cut flat, flat surfaces. Again, that's a definition of a glacier. Uh, they, when they carve gouges, they leave moraines or, or, you know, sort of like gravels, these gravel ridges, both at the end where they were shoving the gravel and along the edges where they were cutting. So glaciers can't do this. Now, the thing is, I followed that planation surface right across Newfoundland, the island of Newfoundland, up into Labrador, which is again on the mainland of, of northeastern Canada, and I followed it for about a 1,000 kilometers, which is, what, about 600 miles. And so if you can picture it, and it's the trippiest thing. I got pictures in the CRSQ article and in one of my newsletters, on, uh, which is on my website. You can look up Play Nation on my website, and you'll see pictures. Um, as far as the eye can see, you're standing up on top of a mountain, and as far as the eye can see, all of the mountains for 100 kilometers – in either direction, are completely flat across the top. The tops have been cl cut off. And the whole thing is completely flat. What on earth would do that? Well, there's only one thing. High-speed water. And water, first of all, seeks its own level. And water uh, is the only thing that will move, uh, that can do that. And it had to have been moving so fast that it was above what we call cavitation speed. And basically, uh, cavitation is a real serious problem uh, in mechanical and physical engineering. Uh, ship propellers, for example, they spin so fast in the water that what happens is the water, if you can picture it, actually takes a jump off of the propeller. So the propeller is moving on an angle through the water so fast that it, it causes the water to jump and it creates a perfect vacuum this sort of gap between the water and the propeller. And it's a perfect vacuum, and that vacuum sucks in the water with incredible force and slams the water against the propeller. And it will literally chew metal apart. Wow. And so that's why they have to be careful when they're engineering. They have to be careful for, for cavitation. Um, the uh, Glen... Oh, what was the name of that dam? There's a dam on the Colorado River in Arizona. Uh... Glen Canyon, the Glen Canyon Dam, that was it. Uh, another classic example of cavitation. They had a massive spring flood. They had to open up their, uh, their emergency uh, tunnels to bail off all kinds of water, or the water was going to go right over the top of the dam. That uh, was a very serious situation. And so they. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm looking at pictures of it right now. Okay, yep. They, they opened the gates wide open and let the water flow as fast as it wanted. The cavitation carved huge chunks out of the tunnel. The uh, steel reinforced concrete walls uh, carved into the bedrock, <laughs> uh, and it was it was a major cleanup because now they had this huge hole underground that they had to they had to fix. And yeah, as you can say, as you can see, you can look pictures of it up online. That's what cavitation could do. And uh, so whatever the, whatever was going on with these mountains, water was moving so fast that it was cutting the rocks regardless of how hard the rock was. Um, for example, one of the places that this, this planation surface is found is, again, at Joggins in Nova Scotia. And I mentioned there was like about 20,000 feet of vertical, 20,000 vertical feet of rock layers. Well, the rock layers were all, all, all laid down horizontally, but when the mountains were formed, they were all tilted about 20 degrees to the south. And so you can walk along the beaches and examine 20,000 feet worth of, worth of rocks from the convenience of the beach. It's really nice. 
But if you stand back and take a look, uh, especially during low tide, uh, the Bay of Fundy there is the highest tides in the world. They, the water goes up and down 45 feet twice a day. And it's, it's quite the sight to see. And so the water comes up, and during high water, uh, the rocks get eroded by the water. And then during low tide, uh, if it's in the winter, all that water freezes and shatters the rock. And so you get this incredible amount of erosion from the tides that goes on. And so if you stand out in the bay during low tide, you can see that the rocks are actually sticking up out of the, out of the, out of the, the bed of the ocean. And the reason is, is because some of those rocks are harder than the others. So, of course, the softer rocks break up and get eroded real quickly. The harder ones are left behind because they take a lot longer to erode. Uh, hopefully you can picture that. Can you picture that? Oh, absolutely. Okay, hopefully. Uh, in fact, I was reading about that uh, earlier today. It's uh, differential erosion? That's correct. That's correct. They erode okay. differently. Yeah, you got it. Uh, differential erosion. That's correct. And so now if you're standing there looking towards the cliffs, the Jonathan's Cliffs, take a look at the top of the cliff. It's the exact same rocks, but those rocks have been cut off completely flat. So whatever this water was, was moving, and that's all that could do it, was moving so fast it didn't care about rock hardness. It was completely oblivious to material. It just cut it off. If it was in its road, it cut it off. <laughs> and uh, so here's the thing. In Newfoundland, the, the tops of those mountains is 1,500 feet above sea level. And the ocean is right there. You can stand on top of the planation surface and look down on, on the ocean. And uh, so you've got a thousand kilometer stretch of mountain ranges on the east coast of Canada that have all been cut off at 1,500 feet above sea level by water that was, by my estimation, moving at least 30, 40 miles an hour. <laughs> and uh, for for my American friends, uh, what is a hundred, or I'm sorry, a thousand kilometers? A thousand kilometers is about 600 miles. I had to ask. Okay, yeah. So it's, uh, a, a, a stubborn American. Yeah, yeah, that's why. Right. Over to the that's metric right. system. So it's, it's, I mean, if you can picture that, well, if you've got a tidal wave moving at 30, 40 miles an hour minimum, um, that's 900 or 600 miles wide, cutting off, moving so fast that it's cutting the tops off mountains, well, what do you have? You have a worldwide flood. Oh. But it gets better than that. When you head out to the West Coast, uh, out here in, uh, right on the border of Alberta and Saskatchewan in Canada, and portions down in Montana as well, there's uh, the Cypress Hills uh, Interprovincial Park. And again, these are uh, smaller mountains that have been cut off flat at the top. But the thing is, there's a clue as to just how fast that water was moving. The mountains are covered in these rounded rocks, rounded boulders, and they're made of a rock called quartzite, which is extremely hard. And um, it's basically sand that has been compressed uh, through extreme heat and, and pressure into rock again. And they're very tough, very tough rock. And so these rocks were rounded, broken apart, and rounded into boulders by moving water. But if you look closely at the rocks, they're covered in hammer marks. And that is from the water actually moving so fast, it was picking these boulders up and hammering them against each other. Now, wow. many of these boulders, you need to understand, are like 20, 30 pounds. So think about how fast that water has to be moving to be able to pick up a rock, 30 pounds, to pick it up and actually hammer it against other rocks. So uh, Michael Ord and Peter Klebberg actually did the math. We actually have charts geological charts that uh, geologists use to calculate the speed of water depending on on uh, the size of rock that they're picking up. Well, this is so far off the scale they had to extrapolate. The, the chart just doesn't go that high. Uh, <laughs> but they were able to pinpoint it down to about 70 to 75 miles an hour minimum. Wow. So, and, and I was reading about that, and that was just uh, rocks, these quartzites, that were about six inches across. Yeah, no, there's there's others that are much larger than that. <laughs> the, but, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's just, you know, that's minimum. Yes. So that's a minimum speed. And here's the thing. Those rocks did not come from Alberta and Saskatchewan. They came, we can we can tell the direction the rocks came from because uh, the if you can picture it, as the water is slowing down, the bigger rocks will drop out first because they're heavier. 
and the water can still be moving fast enough to carry smaller rocks. And so if you can picture it, you stand on the smallest rocks, face the direction of the biggest rocks, and you now can tell the direction from which these rocks came from. Can you picture that? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So when we face that direction, that's towards Idaho. Well, now you start walking and look for the nearest outcrop of quartzite. Where did that come from? Well, the nearest outcrop in that direction we could find is 800 kilometers away, which is about 500 miles in Idaho. Wow. So these rocks were picked up in Idaho by water traveling a minimum of 70 to 75 miles an hour, transporting those rocks all the way to Alberta and Saskatchewan, cutting the tops off mountains, leaving behind these rocks uh, with hammer marks all over them, and that mountain is now about 1,500 feet above sea level. So what does that all mean? Well, it all means a global flood. A global flood, a worldwide-scale flood, is the only thing that can do that. All right, I'm going to stop right there, friends. Tomorrow we're going to just pick up exactly where we left off here today. And if you guys want to talk about this, if you'd like to chat, you can catch me on Google+, Facebook, and Twitter. And with that, I love you guys, and I'll see you tomorrow.